And so I figured that this would be a good time for George to show you fellas a few things about convertible tops. Gosh, Lee, mechanical jobs are duck soup for Bill and me, but don't you think convertible tops are a little out of our line? Not at all, Jim. You see, working on a convertible top is a mechanical job, too, so it ought to be right up your alley. Well, I'd better get back up front now, but I'll drop around later to see how you're getting along. Guess that's your cue to take over, George. Okay, Tech. I've already taken the rear seat and some of the trim out of this car so we can get a look at the top operating mechanism. Here in one compact unit, there's a fluid reservoir, an electric motor, and a hydraulic pump. This unit pumps fluid under pressure to the cylinders. Yeah, and the pistons in the cylinders push the top up and down. That's the story in a nutshell. But now, let's take a look at how the system operates by starting at the top control switch located on the instrument panel. This is a double rotary type switch with a built-in circuit breaker to protect the circuit against damage from shorts. It's the control switch that directs current to the correct terminal on the electric motor. Yeah, I notice there's two leads into the motor. How come? That's because it's a reversing motor, Bill. Here's how it works. When you move the top control to the left, current flows to the lower terminal on the motor. The motor drives the pump, so fluid is forced into the bottom of the cylinders. That pushes the pistons up and raises the top. I get it. And when the switch is moved to the right, current goes to the upper terminal. This reverses the motor and pump, forcing fluid into the top of the cylinders, and the top lowers. George, uh, just where does the reservoir fit into the hydraulic system? Well, with the cap off the reservoir, you watch the fluid level while I raise the top. Say, the fluid level dropped down quite a bit. That's what it's supposed to do, Jim. Sure. You see, it takes more fluid to raise the top than to lower it. So the pump takes that extra fluid from the reservoir. And when the top's lowered, the extra fluid goes back into the reservoir. That's why the top should be down any time you check the level or add fluid. I see. Well, if you added fluid with the top raised, that extra fluid might overflow when the top's lowered. That's the idea, Jim. The right level is two inches below the top of the reservoir, and it ought to be checked every 10,000 miles or once a year. If you have to add fluid, make sure you put in hydraulic brake fluid. And remember, fellas... Keep that brake fluid in a container that's never been used for anything else. Because even a little oil can damage the hydraulic system. It's also a good point to tighten all connections whenever you have to add fluid. Okay, I'll remember that. But tell me, how does a low fluid level affect top operation? If the level gets so low that the reservoir runs dry before the top is fully raised, the pump will pull air into the system. Then the pump pressure will drop and the top won't raise all the way. Not only that, every time the pump takes in a gulp of air, it'll grunt and groan and the whole system will vibrate. In a case like that, you have to bleed the system and add fluid. Is it much of a job to bleed the system? Ordinarily, you can force air out of the lines by adding fluid and running the top up and down. This makes the air bubble out into the reservoir. What about air getting trapped in the cylinders, George? Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Tech. If air should get trapped at either the top or bottom of the cylinders, the top operation is apt to be slow and jerky. When that happens, ordinary bleeding, like I just mentioned, won't get rid of the trapped air. You see, in normal operation, the pistons don't travel all the way to the top and bottom of the cylinders, so they can't push all the air out. Well, how do you get it out, George? With the top raised, disconnect the cylinders from the top linkage by pulling the bolt out of the clevis at the upper end of the piston rod. Next, run the pistons all the way to the top and bottom of the cylinders several times 
by operating the top control switch. The pistons will push all the air out through the reservoir. And make sure you aim those piston rods so they won't hit anything. George, wouldn't a worn pump or motor give you about the same trouble as air in the cylinders? Well, it might, Bill, but I've never run into a case like that. Besides, you wouldn't replace a pump and motor assembly until you'd checked everything else. Now, for instance, check the battery and see that all electrical connections are clean and tight, especially the ground lead on the motor. Another thing, a damaged hydraulic line will cut down the flow of fluid to the cylinders, and that'll slow up top operation. Right, Tech. And a bind somewhere in the top linkage might cause hard operation. How would you locate a bind like that, George? Well, you'd disconnect the cylinders from the top linkage, and then raise and lower the top by hand. If it binds, you'd check the pivot points to find the trouble. Nice going, George. You've covered the important points on the top operating mechanism. What's next? I thought we'd take the top locking mechanism now, Tech. You know, that locking mechanism is inside the top header. And I never gave much thought as to how it works. Yeah, it's pretty simple, Bill. When the locking handle is turned to the lock position, tapered locking pins in the header bar fit into the tapered holes in the windshield header dowels. This pulls the header bar tight against the windshield. You can see that this tapered locking pin is centered in the hole in the header, so it will line up and enter the hole in the dowel. I suppose the pins could get forced off center if someone forced the top down on the dowels when the locking handle is in the locked position. Yep, and in that case, you'd use a screwdriver to pry them back so they're centered. Now, if a dowel is too low, the tapered pin won't enter the tapered hole in the dowel. Wouldn't a shim under the base of the dowel fix that, George? Right, Jim. But only shim under the side of the dowel toward the center of the windshield. Don't shim under both screws. You see, if you raise the whole dowel, the header bar may not fit tight enough on the windshield to make a good seal. Speaking of seals, George, how about telling the boys how water might get through the header? Okay, Tech. You see... The header is made by spot welding two pieces of metal together. Sometimes you may find a small opening between the spot wells. If water gets through the joint and into the header bar, it'll run out to the corners, then into the side rails, and finally leak down inside the car. I see, George, but uh, how do you go about sealing an open seam in the header? Just work some heavy sealing compound into the seam with a flat stick and use a sealer that won't stain the top. It pays to water test the job after sealing by shooting a fairly heavy stream of water directly against the seam for several minutes. Then lower the top to make sure no water got through the header and into the side rails. Well, that takes care of that. Now, if someone will turn this record over, George can tell us about the top linkage. Tech said you were going to cover top linkage adjustments next. Uh, have we covered everything on the header bar? Not exactly, Jim. You see, the top linkage adjustments control the header bar alignment with the dowels. On this top, the holes in the header bar line up okay with the dowels. But you might find a case where the top doesn't travel forward far enough to bring the header holes in line with the dowels. Or the top may travel forward too far, so the header holes overshoot the dowels. Forward travel of the top is controlled by the adjustment of this pivot at the rear end of the rear linkage arm. Looks like you'd have to move the whole bracket to move the pivot. That's right, Bill. First, you loosen the pivot bracket attaching bolts and the pivot bolt. Then move the pivot bracket toward the front or the rear until the holes in the header line up with the dowels. Then tighten the attaching bolts. I get that part okay, George. But how about centering the header from side to side? Well, let's suppose the header bar is off to one side, so the holes don't line up with the dowels. In that case, you might also find that the header may be high in one corner, as well as off-center. Adjustment of this side bracket controls both the centering and the leveling of the header. One adjustment takes care of both conditions, huh? Sure. 
Just loosen the bracket bolts and the pivot bolt. Then raise or lower the bracket until the header bar is level and centered so it lines up with the dowels. And Bill, when you're making adjustments on the top linkage, raise and lower the top a couple of times to check yourself. Sometimes one adjustment may affect something else. Okay, Tech. I can see now where adjusting the side brackets might affect the fit of the top of the window glass at the side rails. Right, Bill. That's why it's a good idea to make sure the top raises and lowers right and locks tight on the windshield before making any side rail or glass adjustments. You ought to be ready to explain those glass adjustments now, George. Right. You see, fellas, there are a lot of glass adjustments on a convertible that you won't find on other body styles. Those extra adjustments are okay, but you want to study the alignment of all the windows before you make any adjustments. You want to check the alignment of the front edge of the vent wing frame with the windshield post. Then, check the alignment of the top of the door glass with the top of the vent frame and with the top of the quarter window. Also, the fit of the rear edge of the door glass with the front edge of the quarter window. And make sure the top of the door glass and the top of the vent frame fit tight against the side rail weather strip. Sounds like a lot to check, Tech. Well, there's nothing very difficult about it. Tell them, George. I always start with the vent wing because it has to line up with the windshield post. The windshield is the only stationary or fixed point to work from. Now, suppose I pull the garnish molding and trim panel. Then I can show you how those window adjustments are made. This vent wing attaching brace can be adjusted by loosening one of the adjusting nuts and tightening the other to tip the vent wing forward or backward. Now, if the vent wing stands out away from the side rail weather strip, it won't make a good seal. To correct a condition like this, loosen the attaching brace adjusting nuts and the cap screw at the lower end of the front door glass run channel. That front channel is part of the vent wing assembly. That's why loosening the lower end of the channel lets you adjust the top of the vent wing and front corner of the door glass at the same time to get a tight fit against the weather strip. Looks like the lower end of this rear run channel can be adjusted the same way. Sure, Bill. That rear channel adjustment lets you fit the upper rear corner of the door glass tight against the side rail. And right in here, there's another channel adjusting screw that can be reached without removing the trim. Loosening this screw also lets you tip the door glass toward the side rail. Sometimes that's all you need. You don't have to remove the trim. What would you do if the top edge of the door glass didn't line up with the vent or the quarter window? First of all, Jim, loosen the door glass upper stops, the regulator adjusting nut, and the channel screws. Then, have someone hold the glass so it lines up at the vent and at the quarter glass while you tighten the channel screws, regulator nut, and the door glass stops. After you make this adjustment, close the door and run the window up and down several times to check ease of operation. If you find the window is too tight, you would loosen the channel screws and move the channels apart. If the window is too loose, move the channels together. George, there's a space between the front edge of this rear quarter window and the rear edge of the door glass. Can the rear quarter window be adjusted? Sure it can. You see, the rear quarter window turns on the quarter window pivot bolt. The rear corner of the window runs in a curved channel. There are stop screws to limit the travel of the rear quarter window. In this case, I'll back off the front screw so the glass will move forward and line up with the rear edge of the door glass. There. See if that quarter glass lines up with the door glass now. Yep, that adjustment did the trick. Now notice that when the quarter glass is raised, the upper corner enters this channel section of the weather strip. I see. The glass has to line up so that corner will enter the channel without binding. That's it. Now I'll show you the adjustment that lets you tip the top of the glass in or out. These two bolts anchor the whole quarter window assembly. Loosen them 
and you can tip the glass to make it line up in the channel. Incidentally, I usually check the weather strip attaching screws to see that they don't stick out and nick the glass when it's raised. What's next on the list, George? I haven't covered the side rail hinge adjustments yet. The side rails are hinged over the door and the quarter window so they'll fold up short enough to fit in the top well when the top is lowered. When the top is up, the front and second sections of the side rails should line up so they'll form a straight line. There's a stop screw at each side rail hinge that can be turned in or out to line up the side rails. That adjustable front side rail pivot point also affects side rail adjustment. You're going to tell the fellows about it, George? Well, Tech, the fellows probably won't have to touch that adjustment once in a blue moon. But just in case they do, they'll find the whole story right here in this reference book. As a matter of fact, that book will come in handy any time you want to brush up on the adjustments George has covered. Well, how are you fellas making out? We just finished up, Lee, and George did a swell job. And you can bet the know-how the boys picked up today is going to come in mighty handy. For it's that kind of information that helps us give our customers the kind of service that keeps them satisfied. Thank <laughs> you.